It's a real pr pleasure to be here at NHS providers today. And it's uh, an absolute privilege to have the uh, opportunity to close this year's conference. The future of the NHS has been the key theme, as I understand it, of this conference, and clearly rightly so. If we look at this year, we marked the NHS's 70th birthday in the summer. The government confirmed increased funding of 20.5 billion pounds for the NHS over the next five years. And with the input of the people in this room, we're developing a long-term plan to span the next decade of healthcare across the country. So there's a lot to talk about. But before I talk about where we're going, I think it's worth just acknowledging where we've come from. And absolutely, I would like to start that with a big thank you. There can be no denying that the last year has been tough for NHS providers. Coming off the back of several years that have seen challenging conditions for the NHS. People in this room have been asked to do many challenging things simultaneously. Deliver higher quality care. Improve against important performance standards for our patients. Drive new and unparalleled uh, levels of efficiency. And make progress on balancing the books. That's being done against a context that uh, has clearly been the subject of much discussion today around workforce shortages. We know that in addition to our 1.1 million whole time equivalent staff, we've got about 108,000 vacancies across the NHS as a whole. And so in this context, clearly the activities um, of your organisations and the frontline staff that work within them have been very significant. At the same time, being honest, we need to acknowledge the challenging financial conditions that organisations represented in this room have experienced uh, in recent years. Last year, the provider sector ended the year £1 billion in deficit, give or take a few million. And we all know that across the provider sector, the 230 NHS organisations, we have a substantial underlying deficit to deal with. You may recall that in my Q1 report on the state of the provider sector, um, we identified um, the, the underlying deficit um, in the provider sector that your organisations had reported to us. That was a gross figure of £4.3 billion. Pounds, um, which after the Provider Sustainability Fund is about 1.85 billion. And this number exists in a system where um, we've had significant tariff deflation in recent years and where the scaling factor, the difference between average cost of delivering care and the income the NHS pays you to provide it, is now running at about 10%. So there are lots of constraints and I know those will have been discussed um, in the conference to date, but I think it's also worth remembering that despite all these constraints, which I'll address uh, in the go forward bit of this uh, speech in a few minutes, um, we should start by saying thank you to the people in this room for delivering more and better care to the patients that you look after. Because I think it's undeniable that despite the constraints, very good things have been delivered up and down the country for patients. Some proof points for me, well, if you look at the results of CQC inspections of providers, across the 18 months, we've seen an increase in organisations rated good or outstanding from just 45% to now 56%, a significant increase. And millions of now patients, millions of our patients are now being served by organisations which are rated good or outstanding. Despite record levels of demand, you are now seeing more emergency patients within the four-hour standard than ever before. Last year, the NHS saw 5.6 million patients within four hours. That's 200,000 patients more than was the case in the year before. Similarly, we're seeing more patients start treatment within the 18-week standard. And in cancer, 
We've seen a 15% year-on-year increase in patients referred for suspected cancer. And against this context, you've increased the numbers of patients treated within the 62-day standard each month by over 1,000 patients, from around 10,000 a month to about 11,000 a month. And finally, on World Mental Health Day, it's great to note that whether it's increasing access to psychological therapy, early intervention in psychosis, or getting access to children and young people who need access to eating disorder services, the NHS that you deliver has met the targets across those really important domains. So we have to start by saying a heartfelt thank you to the people in this room for the work you're doing for your patients, delivering more quality, pushing yourself on performance, making progress on efficiency. These are important and incredible things, and it is clearly NHS patients that have benefited. But, uh, but given the constraints that I talked about and that everybody in this room experiences, what of the future? I believe it's our job now to make things better for the next phase of the NHS's history and for our patients. We're at an inflection point, in my view, in the history of the NHS. As we look ahead five years and as we look ahead ten years, we all know that we need to look after a population that is gaining uh, rapidly in average age and gaining significantly in average frailty. That means that we will have to look at our current models of care, our financial flows, the relationships between the organizations that deliver and commission care, and yes, I believe even our mindsets as leaders in an NHS, which is here for patients. And so I believe that as we look towards the long-term plan, we need to think about this as a radical uh, rethink to put the NHS in its 71st year back onto a sustainable clinical and financial footing for the future. To do this, we've been given five years of certainty in relation to revenue funding and we've been asked to set out our vision for a 10-year plan. I think importantly, I see the 10-year plan as two equally important, but potentially quite different things. The first of those is to deliver a look ahead 10 years with the best possible understanding of where we want patient care to be. We think about just one example in relation to cancer care, for instance, the opportunities to ensure that care is not only excellent in 10 years, but also that wherever we can, we diagnose cancers successfully at the earliest stage of their progression, given that we know that that will have a significant impact on patient outcomes. So I think it's absolutely right that part of this planning exercise looks out to 2028 and says, what would we need to believe we have to put in place to help those clinical objectives be met? That's very important, and that work is part of the long-term planning process. However, I think it's fair to say that a compelling vision for 2028 is not enough. Given the constraints and issues that the NHS is facing today, we owe it to the NHS to produce a robust plan for the next five years, being clearer about what services will change and how, what we're going to do in phases year by year over the five years, and what we need in terms of workforce, finance, digital capacity, in order to execute. Clearly, this cannot be a plan that is devised in isolation from the NHS. That is why Simon and I uh, have been so clear that we want so many of other work streams 
that effectively look at both where we need to be and how we need to get there to be led by people who are sitting in this room today. In addition to people's busy day jobs, um, 15 chief executives are acting as SROs or co-leads in developing our plan. Indeed, I've met so many people behind the bike sheds um, that um, it's, uh, it's hard to uh, imagine anything but uh, talking to people, uh, groups of chief executives, individual chief executives about the long-term plan and its context. I also know that all the work streams we've got have had many engagements um, across the field as well. And that's important because in draft drafting a long-term plan, I think we all understand that we've got some tough processes to go through. 3.4% revenue is as generous a settlement um, as we could hope, have hoped for, and I believe that it is clearly the most generous of any public service. But inevitably, we will have difficult choices to make, and so we're going to need to prioritise. And that process needs to involve the people in this room. That's why, in addition to the work streams, uh, we'll be, uh, we have extended an invite to every single chief executive and accountable officer in the country to meet and be part of the conversation later this month. We not only want feedback on the thinking of the plan as it's developing, but we also need help to focus the plan and its choices and to help us prioritise. And when we've made these choices, my commitment to you is that we'll be going to be very transparent about them and the assumptions that underline them. Because at the end of the day, this is not going to be NHS England's plan or NHS Improvement's plan. It'll be the NHS's plan. And the publication of the plan is the start of the journey. Because where the plan gets turned into reality are in the conversations that take place in each locality up and down the country as you decide. Um, how to take forward care within the available resources using the changes that we're outlining in the plan. Within that, I think we all know that we owe it to our patients to ensure that the plan puts providers back on a financial uh, sustainable footing, that it makes the NHS simpler, that it offers higher quality, more standardised and more integrated care and that all of us and our organisations are more transparent. So let's talk about the plan itself. I think there are lots of things I can talk about, but in the interest of time, I think I'll focus on just a few that I think you might be interested in. Looking at the way we run the system, the way we use money in the system, how we drive efficiency in the system, and how we have the workforce that you need to deliver care for your patients. Let me start with finance. Our current financial architecture was developed at a time when the provider deficit was threatening to break £2.5 billion and needed very serious grip. We developed control totals, and I believe that they were vital to help get things back under control. But I also think we need to be honest. Control totals have had negative consequences, and they are worth acknowledging. A short-term mentality, a significant dependence on non-recurrent savings, and on occasions, disempowered trust boards who haven't been able to manage their financial affairs in the way that we would like them to and that they would like to. We now have too many trusts um, who are not in a position to break even, with the combination of an underfunded tariff and increasing growth, 5.1% non-elective demand increase this year to date. And in addition to that, we have trusts who are unable to attract the funding in the PSF, the Provider Sustainability Fund, um, and thus potentially slipping into a deeper and deeper financial problem while at the same time, some trusts are increasing their surpluses. So I believe, in the long-term plan, we have an opportunity and an obligation to design a fit-for-purpose architecture. And so you might reasonably ask, well, okay, that's great. What's it going to look like, and what are we going to do? 
Well, I think the obligation is on us over the next few weeks to be clear about that, but I've got a few thoughts I want to share with you today. In dramatically reshaping things, um, we need to have a move beyond control totals. We need to move beyond the PSF, and we need a dramatic reduction in unnecessary and unhelpful micro-incentives, fines, and contract quibbles. I'll say what's going to happen from the 1st of April, or what we're proposing would happen from the 1st of April, but I think we should start by saying that given where we start from, I hope you'll understand that we can't do this in a day or in one year, because we would then run, I think, a risk of destabilizing the NHS's finance, and the obligation is on us to balance in every year, as well as get ourselves back onto a financial even keel. So getting from here to a radical vision will require a glide path. And 2019, therefore, I believe will need to be a transitional year, but where we move decisively towards the objectives I've outlined. So from the 1st of April, I'd like to see the Provider Sustainability Fund, which is currently sitting at 2.45 billion, to be very significantly reduced potentially by up to a 10-figure number, with the funds released going directly into the urgent and emergency care tariff price, which, as we know, has been significantly underfunded. In addition to that, from the 1st of April, I'd also like to get rid of the illogical marginal rate, which effectively um, means that trusts are unable to cover the costs of emergencies. And I'd also like to see the end of the 30-day readmission fines. So I think there will be a focus on moving towards a better funding of urgent and emergency care, and I think that will be in the interests of patients. In addition, I think I'd like to see a move away from a contractual model, a potentially antagonistic contractual model um, for urgent and emergency care towards blended payments which will enable trusts to more appropriately resource the fixed costs of running an emergency service. And you will see these proposals outlined in our tariff engagement document. This potentially radical set of changes is a big first step, but a first step nonetheless along a journey towards a simpler, fairer system adequately compensating trusts for, what, for the work that they're doing, especially on the non-elective side. And consequently, the ask of each of you will be to engage in realistic activity and demand assumptions. We can't have the system work well uh, if um, those assumptions are unrealistic. And that's why, in addition to the work we're asking you to do with your commissioners, um, we're intending to include a break glass clause in case emergency activities next year are substantially higher than anticipated. I believe that we will need to retain control totals in 2019-20, and I want to be honest about that, because I think it's important to ensure the NHS as a whole balances the books. But I do know that two things should be true. One, uh, a significant number of those control, control totals will need to be rebased to make them stretching but achievable um, for 2019-20. Uh, and secondly, that beyond 2019-20, uh, we need to grasp the nettle um, and move beyond control totals decisively so that trusts can set their own financial plans again. The changes in mechanisms I've talked about are significant. They, alongside the resource decisions that we have to make in the long-term planning process, um, need to contribute to a situation where, admittedly in a number of years rather than over one year, but absolutely within the period of the five-year settlement that we have, um, providers that operate efficiently are able to once again regularly plan on reaching a break-even position. That's a radically different situation um, from the one that exists in many of your organizations now. So we can't have demand, activity, or tariffs as a balancing factor that then don't turn out to be real. 
instead of which we need a simpler, easier financial architecture that enables us to balance the books in organizations and make progress towards improving the underlying financial position of the provider sector. Let me turn to efficiency. I think it's important to say right at the start that efficiency cannot be a balancing factor either. In terms of pure productivity, it's absolutely fair to say that the NHS um, starts from a very positive place with levels of productivity across the National Health Service continuing to significantly outstrip strip the UK economy as a whole. The, accom the accomplishments of people in this room, I think, are things to be proud of, and that is a great place to start. But at the same time, that does not mean, and nor should it mean, that we won't be making efficiencies. While it's no point saying that we can magic efficiencies up and use them as a balancing act to make things that don't add up apparently add up, and I'm absolutely clear on that, I think it's also true to say that as public servants, we have an obligation to spend every penny to maximum effect. And that also we have significant and real, unwarranted, unexplained and often unacceptable variation across the NHS. From the way we organise our frontline clinical care to the back office that runs the NHS organisations that we're part of. I could quote numerous examples, but in the interest of time I'll just pick two. A 300% variation in length of stay for an acute pneumonia across English hospitals. Or a cost per diagnostic test varying from £2 a test to £35 a test. Um, those are very significant things, and there are so many examples of this. I'm really pleased that Mike Deegan um, and colleagues looking at the efficiency work um, are working to identify the areas that we will need to address, but I am absolutely clear that both within organisations and across systems, um, these variations are going to be very important to us, and frankly, I think we owe it to our patients to make real progress on that as part of the next few years. This leads me to system architecture. For those of us that have been in the NHS a long time, I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, people in this room were from organisations that were competitors. We were working within a system where each of you was out to promote the organisational uh, objectives that you held in competition with your neighbours and other providers. In the context of a growing population of frail elderly patients, I think it's now widely accepted that that is not the way we should be organised going forward. I don't believe that integrated care can be developed out of organisational silos, let alone organisations acting as islands. I think the consequences of that is that the ask on providers over the next five years is no longer confined to creating success at an organisational level, important though that is, and I'll come back to that. Performance henceforth is absolutely about delivering for the needs of the population that you serve. Working together with other bits of the health service and taking a stronger shared responsibility in how, deciding how best to use the resources that you will have to deliver over the next five years. I think in the context of that, developing integrated care is not an optional extra. Integrated care systems, I think, will be central to the delivery of the long-term plan and need to be able to cover the whole of the country within the relatively short term. On the provider side, I think we'll also expect to see significant change, more cooperative, more cooperative standardised care being delivered. That may be in a number of forms. We're seeing moves towards provider groups. We're seeing increased uh, trend of organisations coming together through formal merger. Um, I think there will be continued focus in those areas. I think at the same time, it's also worth reminding ourselves that that does not mean in any way a lack of focus on strong provider boards. It's a question I'm asked a lot when I go and talk to non-executives. The fact that providers will be working together as part of integrated care systems 
um, and the fact that that is a part of the expectation on providers um, does not and cannot substitute for the important function that every provider board has and will continue to have um, for looking after the organisation that they're responsible for, the care of their patients um, and the money um, that comes into it. Finally, workforce. And I know from conversations with many, many people, including some over lunch today, that a key test of realism of the plan will come down to workforce. Do we have the people that we need to deliver the plans that we have? During the 10 years of the plan, I think our aim is clear. But by the end of the 10 years of the plan, we need to be at least in balance between supply and demand for all professional groups across the National Health Service, with many professional groups being in supply and demand significantly before the 10-year period. Jim Mackey and Naveena Evans are working hard on a plan which, however ambitious, looks at achieving that. At the same time, the plan cannot be about jam tomorrow, because I think we all understand the constraints that are on our organisations as we speak today. So the plan also will focus very hard on maximising supply during the next five years. That means absolutely looking to maximise staff coming into the NHS, including from the opportunities for increased international recruitment. But I think it's also true that it includes elements such as ensuring that our skilled staff work at the top of their license and deliver the maximum benefit from patients. It's also true um, that um, it's the case that the majority of staff at the end of the next five years um, will also be the staff we have today. And so I'm convinced that the plan will want to look at what we can do and what you can do uh, to improve retention rates, reduce attrition rates, and use technology uh, and job planning to make sure that we get the best from the staff that we have. In addition to that, um, uh, and I think there's some way to go, if I'm honest, um, both in terms of the extent to which tools like e-rostering are used across the NHS to maximum effect, or indeed um, the extent to which consultants have an effective job plan which varies hugely between organisations. So I think the workforce elements of this uh, will be incredibly important uh, and my hope and expectation is that Jim and Navina's work um, will be a call to action that all of us will need to be a part of to make sure we maximise workforce supply over the next five years. So those are some of the elements that we need to address conclusively in the long-term plan. And we need your input into that, and I'm looking forward to having that. But before I close, I'd like to just focus on two more things quickly. First, let's focus back on delivery now. Organisations in this room have done a lot to prepare for winter. I know you've all been working hard to develop capacity plans to phase work across the year to maximum effect. I know you're all planning to build on the already successful increase in the extent to which we offer our staff flu vaccination and they accept it. It's good to see work on reducing delayed transfers of care, which has freed up over 800 beds already. And it's good to see people planning to work with the independent sector where that's appropriate to use capacity within the contracted hours of consultants and other staff in your employment. It's good to see that there's been a 240 million investment in social care, and at each of your localities, um, I think it's going to be really important that you're engaged in the discussion with local authority colleagues so that we make sure that that then gets to increase the supply of care packages and helps patients not have to be remaining in hospital when they don't need to. It's also good that there's been 145 million allocation of capital to a number of trusts that desperately needed it. Uh, it's clearly very important um, that that capital comes on stream um, by the end of December as per the plan, because we're looking for that to deliver a real increase in capacity. And that is important, because while I think the NHS is going to go into the winter well-planned, and that's a credit to people in this room, 
it's also true um, that we're currently at around between 90 and 93 percent occupancy, occupancy across the acute sector. And so I still think we have more work to do. You may recall, for those of you that have been unlucky enough to listen to me more than once this year, uh, may recall the speech I gave at the Confederation Conference uh, where um, I talked about the need um, for us to free up 4,000 beds um, by looking at um, the patients that have been in our beds for more than three weeks. There's been massive progress on this across the country, but we've still got more to do to deliver that 4,000 beds. And given that in conjunction with all the planning, the expenditure on new capital, the better flu vaccination rates of our staff, those beds will be important. And so my ask of everybody in the room is to make sure that where you have further to go on that, we get into a position by winter where we've maximized capacity. At the end of the day, winter may be hard. Winter is certainly coming, uh, and we need to be well prepared for it. We have still an opportunity to improve. And finally, before I close, I'd like to talk about probably the most important characteristic that will help us deliver for our patients, and that's leadership. And I think, coming back to the NHS after several years away recently, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that um, people in this room have been working in challenging conditions for several years. And I think it's fair to say that it's possible to get used to working in challenging conditions. We know that conditions will continue to be challenging. Winter, we have to get through. I think we also understand that in many areas it will be some time before the new money, important and critical though it is, um, starts to feel like it's coming through. I also know that the people in this room are doing some of the hardest and most complex leadership roles in this country. So in that context, I just think it's really important to reflect on why we're all here. And in that context, I, I could perhaps share with you that I very much enjoyed some time recently spending time talking to first and second time chief executives. And I was really struck by the language they used about their jobs. They talked about the privilege, that was their word, the privilege of leading NHS organisations. I was incredibly impressed by that. We come to work, all of us in this room, because we believe in the National Health Service and we come to work because we want to make it better. We know the National Health Service is the most valued public institution in England and that we know that we have the responsibility for making it the best it can be. So in conclusion, we have a five-year settlement on the money. We've got huge numbers of talented, capable people, including the people in this room. We all of us believe in the NHS's mission for its patients, and I think and hope that we all believe that we can make it better. So I'm looking forward to working with you on that programme. Thank you very much.